what miracles are we talking about? Has the Lord done for you a miracle, big or small? And did you notice that it was a miracle? We look at Jesus and the miracles around the sea. But the story in Mark 4 is, um, I'm about to drop a big English word. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called theophany. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's those words that make you look smarter than you are. <laughs> the details Mark gives us already begins telling you there's going to be a problem here. Jairus' urgency um, is going to be impeded because there's a big multitude. So I don't think Jesus is going to be able to move as fast enough as Jairus would like him, just given the logistics of moving through a crowd. So it's going to be a problem. The times we want to rush God or we end up rushing our own lives because we don't think God has enough power or enough concern or enough with all to handle my needs personally the same way he can handle someone else's needs personally jesus christ of nazareth that's an interesting thing but on the contrary we see that in nazareth that uh, they did not receive him as a hero they did not receive him by faith and uh, and accept him um the same way he was accepted in capernaum let us understand let us understand the prophecies correctly and this is not upon us it's upon the Holy Spirit that works in us. And, and once we listen to what God is speaking to us, then we, we, he will guide us to the right direction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from, and a happy Sabbath to you. It is good to see you and to be able to join you, you this morning, even as you join us in this uh, Sabbath morning. Uh, from New Life SDA Church, we welcome you to our Sabbath, uh, our Sabbath this morning. We hope you've had a good week. As a church, we've had a very challenging week. Uh, in which we've had even a loss of one of our elders as a church, and it's been a difficult week. But the Lord has been good to us, and we have had him encouraging us as a church through the Comforter, saying that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And so we encourage you and anybody else who may have lost their loved ones, even as we, you join us in our pain in the loss of our, one of our ardent viewers, our dear Elder Wanga, who's been following us for a few months now uh, on the online service. We pray for his family and pray that God will continue comforting his family. But God is good and we are here today as a family. I am I'm joined by my team of panelists today we've got new members of the panel and we've got existing members of the panel and it's always good to have new members joining us and so today I'm going to request uh, my members to introduce themselves and then Seraphim will pray for us my name is Masio Dwar and I'll be your moderator this morning Elder Jared it's good to have you uh, if you could introduce yourself to the church uh, happy Sabbath everyone my name is Jared Manyara a member of this church Karibu sana Happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Serafin Okemo. I'm glad to be here. And online we've got uh, our brother Saya, and we also have a new addition online. So, brother Saya, if you could go first, and then we'll have uh, our elder chief. Hey, happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Saya Jackson. Glad to be here with you. Elder uh, Chief. Sabbath. Glad to join you today. I'm uh, Chief and Walker. Uh, it's great to have our members this morning. Serafim, if you could pray for us. Shall we? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sabbath morning. We want to thank you for your grace and your goodness, and especially for allowing us to see this day. I pray that you will be with us as we go, get into the studying of the lesson, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will be our sole teacher and instructor only using us as vessels to exalt your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, our lesson is Inside Out. And as I was trying to look at this title and thinking, what is God talking to us about in this lesson of Mark, looking at Mark chapter 7 and a bit of 8, to see what are we looking at in Inside Out. And our memory text comes from Mark chapter 7 verse 15. And the Bible says, There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And that uh, is uh, Mark 7, 15. 
And this week we are looking at different aspects of Mark. We've been, we've actually, it's interesting to see that we're almost halfway through the book of, um, of Mark, which has in total 16 chapters. And so we are smack coming into the middle of that. And as we look, so we, in, in, in today's lesson, we will look at different, um, we'll look at uh, different lessons. We will look at uh, Jesus encountering the Syrophoenician woman and what he tells this woman. We look at Jesus healing, different kinds of healing. So we've been looking at Jesus healing. We've been looking at miracles. And the question around miracles is that the, the, the people in Jesus' time, so both his disciples, the Pharisees encounter Jesus, Jesus in many miracles and healing. Yet this time we get to see that even with healing, it reveals the importance of the truth that however impressive miracles can be, they alone are often not enough to open the heart to the truth. Because the truth is that sometimes we've had, we've seen miracles, we saw religious leaders seeing miracles, and yet they were bent on rejecting Jesus. So the inside out, the question is, is it that we pay too much attention on the inside? That, no, sorry, on the outside, that we actually don't, we neglect the inside. And the truth is that while we are so busy looking at our outside, God is looking at our inside. And so I'd like us to, you know, to, to, to basically look at what is God talking to us about today in different stories, looking about the inside and the outside. I want to come to you, Elder Jared. This morning, because we look at, uh, in, in, in Mark chapter 7, we see, um, we see Jesus referring to, you know, so we see a situation in which uh, uh, the disciples of Jesus are accused of eating without washing their hands. And I wonder if this is a question of hygiene, or this is, or this is just a question of um, something else deeper. And in this, he actually tells um, the, 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 the religious leaders that they were being hypocritical because one of the things that he accuses them of doing is upholding the traditions of men and neglecting the law of God. And I want us to take us through what is this in terms of human traditions versus the commandments of God. Thank you, Sister Mazi. Uh, the lesson for this week has challenged me. I remember the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 16 where God says he will vomit us because we are neither cold nor hot. That's the Laodicean church. This is touching on us. Are we calling ourselves Christians, yet we are holding on to traditions which are against divine principles? Here, the religious leaders are complaining about the washing of hands. It's a very serious thing. Um, I remember as I grew up, I grew up in the village and you were told go wash your hands. You simply go dip them without even you, <laughs> you have done it. As long as there, there's water yes. in the hands, you have done it. It was just a ritual. And I think this is the situation in which the, the religious leaders were mm -hmm. They were looking at the disciples of Jesus not following the ritual. It was not the question of hygiene. Mm -hmm. It was the ritual that they had not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And they were feeling like their authority is being challenged. Mm -hmm. Because they consider themselves as the custodians of the traditions. Mm -hmm. And now they value these traditions more than they valued the commandments of God. So, Jesus looks at these people and opens their eyes to see what matters. Mm -hmm. It is not what we do, but what matters. Now, they were focusing so much on the outside and not inside. And that's why now Jesus told them that it is what comes out of a person. Mm -hmm. The intention with which you do it. What are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Whom are you trying 
to please. That's the question. And that's why it says that what comes out of the person is what matters. It is basically not what uh, we see outside. If you look at the book, chapter 29, verse 13, the Lord is saying that his people honor him with their lips. What do you normally do? Yeah, when we want to please everyone. We, 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 human beings want to please everyone. Mm. So if you meet this one, you, from the mouth, you just tell them, uh, this is good, uh, you are a good person, or this and this. We try to please. But inside the heart, it could be a very different story. And, and that is why I say, in Isaiah, the Lord was, but their hearts are far from me. In fact, I, I can mention a, a, a few traditions. May, maybe let me mention one. Uh, this week, uh, there was um, a funeral service for one of the journalists who died. And what was so striking is that the casket was outside the church. And there was an uproar. Why are they not taking the casket inside what? The church. How can they disrespect this dead what? Person. Yeah. Yeah, many of us, we have that tradition that we take the body to the church to pray for the body. Mm. But that's against the teachings of heaven. Mm. That once you die, you are gone. It's just the body, nothing else. Mm -hmm. So people are feeling that this dead person was not honored. Mm -hmm. But we don't honor dead people. It is against the divine principles. So, Jesus was trying what was trying to tell the religious leaders about their hypocrisy. Mm. They were not considered the purity of the heart. Yeah? True. They were basically considering the, the purity of the outside. Yet inside might be rotten. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you, Elder. That is so powerful. And Sai, I want to come to you. Because uh, like, like Elder has, uh, has alluded to in terms of some of these traditions that we practice, that we have passed them down for so long that they actually start looking like they're, they're part of our faith. And what are we teaching our children? So I'd like you to also, you know, what are some examples of some of those um, traditions that, on practices that we may have that actually conflict with the word of God and we may not even be aware Okay, thank you. So I'll, I come from the western side of Kenya, and we're very spiritual, but our behavior around death leaves quite a lot um, to be desired. So there's a lot of talking to the dead, um, either during mourning mm -hmm. or um, eulogy um, that happens and is expected. It's actually seen as an expression of sincerity and and sorrow uh, which is against the biblical teaching of the state of the dead that the dead don't know nothing and then in many of those ceremonies there are instances of or, or insistence on blood being shed so you people will want to slaughter a chicken before they do the grave or the people digging the grave will um, demand things like alcohol, which is um, against um, some of the biblical and, and, and you know, and church principles. And then the, um, the, um, the body of the deceased, the pe um, people have to either sleep in proximity to eat. And in some bizarre cases, people actually sleep literally with the, with the dead. So, and, and all of this is premised around um, fear of repercussion of mm. what will happen should one not deal appropriately uh with, uh, with the with the with the with, with the remains of the dead mm -hmm. um the other side you see a lot of conflicts is in the lead up to our marriages or our weddings and there's a lot of greed um, that is manifested or hidden behind culture so mm -hmm. the parents asking some abnormal amounts of bride mm -hmm. price um, and they premise it with words like, no, we don't sell our daughters, but then they proceed to produce things like receipts for school and what they 
um, spent on, you know, what was actually their responsibility and expecting that the incoming signing law would foot bills worth millions of shillings. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they conveniently lay aside scripture and then now want to premise the whole thing on um, culture. And also some of the items I've seen, some bride price negotiations, I've been to, some ask for alcohol, some ask for um, items that are not in, in alignment with, 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 um, um, with, with the will and the way of God. Those would be some that just jumped to my mind at this moment. Thank you, Saya. And that's really interesting because I hope church leaders, I thank God here I have two elders with me, uh, to basically remember that some of these things, because the timings are very emotional, you know, funerals, weddings, has a lot of emotions with it. And so sometimes we bring in these practices and are passing those down to our children without realizing that they are really outright seeing some of them. Seraphim, let's go to clean hands and clean hearts. And uh, looking at our memory verse this morning, uh, when Jesus says that there's nothing that enters a man uh, from outside that can defile him, but the things which come out of him, that uh, those are the things that defile him. Uh, I don't know what you understood from this, especially because uh, we do talk about, you know, what we eat, and it can be defiling. So was Jesus trying to change that, for example, or what is it that he's teaching in terms of talking to us about what really defiles a man's heart and body? Great. So, um, clean hands, clean heart. Uh, reading from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 14 to 19, the Bible actually encourages that what goes through the mouth from the outside in does not defile the seat of the reason or the heart as it goes through you know, the intestines, and then it goes out of the body. Mm -hmm. It is what comes from the heart, influencing actions that defile the man. For example, fornication, murder, bearing false witness, covetousness, etc., etc., as uh, explained in the book of uh, Mark, chapter 7, from verse 17 to verse um, 23. But what we want to ask was then, is, was Jesus doing away with such distinctions? And the answer is a clear no. And why is that? I think there are three main reasons. The first one is that, first and foremost, around that time when Christ was uh, on earth and giving these, um, you know, um, explanations, it was impossible. The, the, the real, I mean, the culture there was Jewish. It was impossible to be correct mm -hmm. and, and indeed advocate for just eating anything because they had laws that governed clean eating. And then again, um, the other thing is just before that, just before we get to Matthew chapter uh, 7 from verse 14, Jesus Christ had advocated for the law. He had advocated for the law and actually defends Moses as, 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 I mean, you know, in the law, according to the law. Um, the other thing is that he does not do away with the part of the Old Testament law. He undermines his own argument in defense of Moses and the law, mm -hmm. you know. And essentially, Christ was not in the business of discouraging clean eating. He was in the business of discouraging us from looking at the external practices as the essence of religion. Mm -hmm. God desires that we honor him in the way we eat, in the way we drink, in the way we, you know, uphold health, uh, things that relate to our bodies. Because somebody would want to ask, as Adventists, are we mistaken in teaching that church members who eat um, meat are to eat only from the clean animal list? And the answer is honestly no. Why? Because God tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that wh whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God, you know? And then 1 Corinthians 6, 20, we are told we are bought with a price. Therefore, we need to glorify God in our body. And I really like that John to, which says, in all things God desires that we prosper in health, even as our souls prosper. Mm -hmm. So you might have the right 
theology, but who fully and really ultimately has your heart. So if Christ truly, truly is the one who has your heart, mm -hmm. you must not only focus on, you know, externalities, mm -hmm. but especially about your heart and also about your health. Very, very true. And thank you, Seraphim. And I want to come to you, Elder Chief, actually, just following up on what Seraphim has finished with. In terms of the kind of theology we might have and the issues of our heart, because the truth is that it's possible to practice all the right things. But how do we ensure that our heart is right? Oh, th thank you very much. I think uh, this is a, this is a very good uh, way to look at it. Um, most of the times, people would uh, always look at, focus on the externals because that's what they can see, and uh, we neglect uh, what really matters. But that doesn't mean, and I think the way my sister has put it, that it doesn't mean that we are saying that don't do certain things which are right. Um, this text has been used so many times by people who want to avoid uh, following the right order of uh, even caring for their body and such. And so people will go and they want to eat anything and they say, after all, not what goes into a man defies a man. But reading this in context, we find that the, the, the greater emphasis is not just placed on outward actions. Mm. That is why this is tied to what we previously alluded to on the traditions. It's not just the actions, but what are the motives that inspire the actions? And that's why when we say, you have the right theology, but who is in charge of your heart? In fact, it ought to be like this. Right theology does not produce a good heart. Actually, it should be the good heart that leads you to doing that which is right. Our actions should come from a good heart. So from within the heart of a man, we, we should have Christ resident in us. With Christ resident in us, the actions then will testify that there is an indwelling Christ in us. Um, a few years back, I was uh, going through certain sermons, and, and, and I loved this sermon title, and, and there's a preacher who was preaching. I was talking about vengeful vegetarians versus peaceful pork eaters. And what I was just saying is, at, at times you can be eating right, but now, what about your heart? Mm. If the reason you are eating right only leads you to hate others, mm -hmm. then it's not necessary. And at times you find some of the people, uh, it's interesting the way you find at times they say, there are some people who are very generous and yet they are drunkards. But, but, but you're wondering if, if generosity and kindness was coming from the Lord, then we expect that those who have Christ in their heart should be able to express this more. Actually, for me, um, in this part, one of the things that uh, I, I picked so clearly in this, and, and that's why in Mark 7, 20, 20, it will read that that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, from within, out of the heart of the man, proceed evil thoughts, adultery, mm -hmm. fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, deceit, lasciviousness and evil life, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. So you see, all these things means that let us clean the heart. When we clean the heart, it leads to clean hands. So whether it's clean hands or clean hearts, let's clean the heart. It will lead to a clean hand. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Chief. Indeed, let us clean our hearts and the rest will follow. If we have a pure heart, then our lives will show the purity and what Jesus has done for us on the inside. Let me come to you, Sire, because uh, in Mark chapter 7 from verse 24, uh, this is one of the most confusing chapters. You know, every time I, I've read this and I've wondered, why would Jesus say such a thing to a woman? Uh, when we see this Greek woman, the Syrophoenician woman, who comes to Jesus for the healing of her own daughter, and Jesus speaks to her in a manner that would shock anybody who is reading this and they know the Lord. So it would be great for us to take us through this to understand what is coming out of this story and why would Jesus talk about crumbs for the dogs in this story? Um, thanks, thanks, Marcy. Interestingly, it's the only argument um, 
if we, if we just look at argumentation that Jesus ever lost or <laughs> appears to have lost in the entire of the scripture. And yes, individually, it's been one of those very troubling passages to read. But so for those who are not too familiar with the context is Jesus has um, gone to this place, him and the disciples, and he wants to rest. But then there's this um, persistent um, Greek Syrophoenician woman who comes seeking healing um, from Jesus on behalf, pleading on behalf of the daughter. And Jesus responds in a very interesting way. He says, um, it is not proper um, to take the bread for the children and give it to the dogs, okay, first. And then the woman responds brilliantly and says, um, but even the dogs um, do eat from the crumbs that are beneath the table. Mm -hmm. So what's the ways of unpacking this? There, there are multiple things that we need to understand. One is every time you're reading Jesus and his dealings, you need to understand he has an immediate audience, he has a secondary audience, and he has a big objective. When you always put those three things together, you're able to gain um, proper perspective. So his immediate audience is the woman. Mm -hmm. His secondary audience is the disciples, whom he needs to um, use this particular scenario as an object lesson. Mm -hmm. And then the ultimate thing he wants to show is what true faith um, can be able to achieve. And the woman seems to pick on this because there are clues in the response that Jesus gives that opens the conversation. The first clue is that Jesus says it is, and um, the children need to be fed fast. Mm -hmm. And so logically it means if there's a fast, then there needs to be at least a second um, in place. And then secondly is the word used for dog here is not some stray street dog. This almost seems like a family a family dog, one that is inside the house and is even allowed within um, under the table. Understanding Jewish culture, dogs were, mm -mm, dogs were, um, somebody calling you a dog, you are an outcast. So the picture of a dog that is being allowed inside the house isn't like a stray wild um, dog. So the way the culture used to speak to each other is different. But just a uh, two second side note here, it's almost the same way we be, uh, when, when you hear Jesus speaking to the mother and calling him woman. woman. Um, in our time and culture, that would be considered rude. But in the immediate culture, then that was very respectful and normal. So this use of language about dogs and bread in that particular immediate setting was probably not as offensive. It was a um, figure of speech that was probably acceptable then. And back away from my detour. So putting those two things together, the woman picks on it and, of course, moved by concern for her daughter, she correctly and aptly says, okay, if the children feed fast, then there should be second, there should be bread for the rest of us. And then she aptly also recognizes that even the dog, this dog that's been accepted, that's really part of the family that's under the table, it can even eat from the crumbs. Mm. What's brilliant about that faith is in, in believing that um, if what is a crumb, if what is a crumb mm -hmm. um, of Jesus' power is his ability to heal a, a lady, the daughter who was not there physically, it almost tells you what she believed is the, what the full loaf of Jesus' power and capability is. And Jesus responds and says, your faith, um, responding to the faith heals the daughter. Mm -hmm. So A, it addresses the need. It, it brings, it draws out the the, the woman even closer. I know I'm running a bit ahead of me, but what I want to say is this. Wh why Jesus has to engage in this back and forth is he's also trying to avoid a very transactional kind of faith mm -hmm. of people who just show up because they want a disease healed and this other thing done. In, in having this engagement, which is riddle field and used a lot of the language of the time, she, he is drawing the woman away from a merely transactional kind of thing and helping her comprehend, appreciate, and understand and embrace the idea of Christ beyond the miracle. And again, just that idea that if the crumb of Christ's power can heal 
a child in proxy. What is a full loaf mm. of Christ's power able Amen. to do? One, and then two for the secondary audience, the disciples, they're able to begin having a deeper appreciation of not only the person of Christ but also the power um, of Christ. And then with one swoop, he's also able to begin piercing through the veil of prejudice mm. and showing that this woman by her request being answered and granted, is no longer considered an outcast as she would have been considered within jury, but she's really been embraced and is now part and parcel of the family. Amen. Thank you, thank you. That is, ah, the word of God never ceases to surprise us, Seraphim. And, and sometimes uh, we, we as a country live in a very prejudiced country. We, are, we divide ourselves in everything possible to divide ourselves into, in, in tribes. And even among the tribes, we'll divide ourselves into, what are they even? I don't even, clans, elder, and subclans. It, it's amazing how we love to divide ourselves in this country, which is really sad. But how does the prejudice, this, the teaching of this story of this woman, how does this one break through uh, the, some of the prejudices we have in, like, as a church or as a nation? And what does the teaching of Jesus show us on how we can purge this sin? Because it's a sin. One thing that is amazing is that we know Christ came for, at that point, the house of Israel. Mm. And, but he decided at that point in time to go through the Syrophoenician place mm. so that he can meet this woman and highlight something. Amen. Of course, he knew there was preju mm. prejudice. Of course, he knew the faith of this woman and he knew through pricking this woman, the woman would not buckle. And after, as a result, a lesson would proceed from the experience. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Friends, it was not an accident. Mm -hmm. It was not an accident that God met this woman and God used this woman to show us faith. But most importantly, reached out to this woman to show us who we should not be. And the question we want to ask is, how can we seek to do away with this evil of prejudices, racisms, <laughs> tribalisms, Cased, you know, mm. I come from here, you're from a very poor community, so I cannot relate with you. You come from this tribe, so my brother cannot marry you, you mm. know. And I mean, this is so real, not only outside there in the world, unfortunately, even in church, church. it is so ripe. And we even have very, you know, intellectual and even sometimes spiritual reasons mm. to excuse these things. But we want to ask ourselves, who is our example? Mm. Christ. And look, what did Christ do? What was his attitude? And what was his principle? He says in the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 26 that from one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the earth. And him who made from one man all nations, he actually marked out their appointed times in the history and the boundaries of the land. That mm. happily they may look after him, though he be not far mm. from them. And in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, he tells us, there is no Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for all are one in Jesus. And I like what a devotional I love reading called, You Shall Receive Power, says, mm. says the wall of secret, se sectarianism and caste and race will fall down when the true missionary spirit enters the heart of men. Prejudice is melted away by the love of God. And so you who is tribalistic in the way you view people and things, you who is racist, and you know, you don't have to tell us, you have this pretentious smile, <laughs> even in church, mm. but we all know that day when you, Akisi, are told your daughter is, is dating a Luo, or you, a Luo, is told your son is seeing a... We know how you will behave. It doesn't matter how well you smile at us. We want to ask you, does Christ's spirit dwell in you? Mm. Do you have the love of Jesus? And if yes, then how has it changed you? Oh. That is so powerful, Seraphim. Today you have spoken, and we elders, you guys need to hear this because um, it's a very rife situation in this country and in this church. So I'm praying to God that the Lord will redeem us. Sister, uh, yes. 
I have gotten a very big challenge mm -hmm. <laughs> in this encounter of Jesus with mm. this lady. Yes. Um, if you look at the book of uh, Romans, chapter 1, verse 16, mm -hmm. it clearly states that the gospel of Christ mm -hmm. was first for the Jews mm -hmm. and the Gentiles knew that. Mm -hmm. So this lady knew mm -hmm. that it starts from where? From the house of Israel. From the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. Not because of favoritism, mm -hmm. but they were given a responsibility mm -hmm. to share the blessings mm -hmm. with those who are not of the household. Mm -hmm. And that is why the children the crumbs that fall down mm -hmm. are the blessings that flow to the Gentiles. Amen. So this lady knew that. And if you look at the book of Isaiah, mm -hmm. chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, Arise, shine. For your light has yeah? come. Mm. So let your light so shine mm -hmm. that others may see light and come. Amen. And we are the light of the world. Mm. So the challenge to me and to all of us, is are we sharing the blessings that we have received from God mm. to others? Mm. We have received this truth. Mm. Are we sharing it with others? Mm. Because once we receive this truth, it changes us. Mm. And we see others not, not as dogs. Amen. Yeah, in this country mm -hmm. of ours, Kenya, mm. every tribe has a nickname for the other tribes. <laughs> And it's a degrading one. Yes. So people have been changed. Mm. <laughs> Don't see those as other tribes. Mm. They see them as brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elder, for adding that because it's really important. Elder Chief, I want to come to you because we look at the healing of another man. And this time, actually, uh, we're looking at the healing of a deaf and dumb man. And chances are this man had been deaf for a very long time because we know that like the, the loss of hearing sort of isolates you and it also affects your, your ability for language. So it means that possibly this man had been deaf for a very long time, possibly his whole life. And that's why he couldn't speak and couldn't hear. And when Jesus enters into the picture, what I found interesting in this verse is when we talk about the fact that Jesus actually sighs. I have never heard anywhere else where, you know, and a sigh is, is, is a very interesting expression. Because it's, it's sometimes an expression of loss of words. Talk to us about this tongue-tied story. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, as, a, as the Syrophoenician woman was being unpacked, and I think I, 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 as we unpacking the Syrophoenician woman, I think I also joined in sign. You know, <laughs> you, you get tongue-tied. Yes. You're wondering, yeah. Uh, what is this? And I, I like the way my sister would put it, that there are certain things that you can articulately put them, but then in your actions, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, you, you, you are speaking and saying, let's not lie to ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we cannot do this, we cannot do this. And, and, and some of these are traditions uh, which do not even have a biblical basis. So on face value, you don't have prejudice, but uh, at heart, and just remind me what you said earlier on. Is it clean hands or clean hearts? So when you look at the story of the Syrophoenician, um, Jesus takes a walk. And um, the, 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 this story is interesting because they bring unto him one who was deaf. And not only was he deaf, he also had impediment of speech. And when they bring this man to Jesus, the Bible says he took him aside from the multitude. And, and, and this also captures my attention. But you see, uh, why would Jesus decide to take him aside from the multitude? And he, he, you know somebody who is deaf and somebody, unlike somebody who is blind, who doesn't know where he's going. A, a deaf person, unless you speak to him and he doesn't respond, you may not know. Unless he is trying to speak to you or he does sign language, you will not know that he doesn't have the ability to speak. And, and this comes out clearly in this story when you look at um, the, 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 the old fact that this person has this impediment and comes to the master. And when the master leaves this man, something is said in, um, in, in, in the text that follows. That is in verse 34 of uh, Mark chapter 7. It says, and looking up to heaven... 
He sighed and said unto him, Ephata, that is, be open. Now, when you read uh, this part, it, it, it comes out very interestingly, and, and I like the way uh, Design of Ages would, would capture this uh, about uh, Jesus' sign. And, and, and it says that he sighed at the thought of the years that could not be opened to the truth. So among the things that would shock Jesus is when we have so much, but we are not able to hear. And, and, and I think it, it's interestingly, uh, it, it's something that is interesting that God can get to a point in time when even God himself is perplexed. And why is God perplexed? Because God will not force his will upon mankind. God allows men Truth can be given. But you see, unless we have our ears open to listening to the truth, we we may be like people who have ears, but we are there. And and that's why when you look at this, uh, Jesus does something that is almost akin to creation. He recreates. And this is what we all need. Those who have been uh, deaf to listening to the word of God, because if, if we are not careful, we may find ourselves in a situation whereby lesson discussion becomes a routine. We may find ourselves in a situation whereby some of the, in the biblical text become just another set of routines, and there is nothing that is so clear about it. So I, I think as, as we go through this, tongue-tied is not only that this man has nothing, but I, I think even, even God is tongue-tied. He, he looks at certain things and he says, I can't force man to accept me. And a man must be willing to come into cooperation with God so that God can be able to loosen his tongue and be able to give him that touch that can enable him even to share God's word. Yeah. Amen. In the end, we all choose, and that is what we discussed the other week, that in the end, we all have to choose. We must choose Jesus because he cannot force us to choose him. Elder very quickly. They are gifts that you have been given. And we have seen the gift of, of, of hearing and the gift of speaking is a gift. And we've been given this gift for a reason. How are you using your gift, Elder? Um, it's quite challenging. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, mm. these are the two gifts mm. that are very critical for ministry. Yeah. Hearing, you must hear the word of God. Amen. Hearing enables you to hear the needs of others. Mm. Then the, the gift of speaking is sharing the good news Amen. with those who have not heard. Mm. And also encouraging even mm. others. Like now, this last week, I had a very interesting encounter. Yeah. There's uh, someone who wanted to witness mm. to another person. But she didn't know what to say. Oh. I remember we spent an hour. I told her how to go about it. Mm. And I think I, it was this gift of speaking mm. that I was able to use. And I remember even the words I was speaking. I, I think the Lord was guiding me. Mm. Because the, 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 the lady said, I, I think I, I'm seeing somewhere, I'm seeing a way of approaching this issue. Mm. And she felt encouraged. Besides that, we use this gift of speaking. You know, there's sometimes we do not know how to talk mm-hmm. certain things, certain truths. How do we teach them? Today morning, mm-hmm. uh, my daughter was asking me a question about the wedding kiss. <laughs> it was uh, very interesting. Eh? You can imagine now, how do you explain to a child, five years old, yeah, why the wedding kiss? Mm. Is it good manners or is it bad manners? Yeah. And I tell you, we had a very interesting discussion. Mm-hmm. And I directed her on why the wedding kiss, and who should have it. And she was really uh, amazed, yeah? Because initially she was telling me she knows 
the wedding is his bad. Mm. Yes. If it is bad, then why do we have a wedding? Mm. Then why do we have the kiss? Mm. It really took a lot of grace <laughs> to explain to my daughter to understand. Actually, many are times, uh, apart from that, there are times you see an opportunity and then just as the title for this day says, you are thankful. Mm. How do I introduce? How do I begin? And where do I begin? Mm -hmm. Yeah? But when we meet Jesus mm. and he touches our ears, mm. puts the words there, mm. once the words are there, we cannot keep quiet. As Jesus told these ones not to say anything mm. about it, mm. they could not hold it. Amen. Yeah, so we need to allow Jesus to put his truth in us mm. and fire us up mm. to speak that truth. Thank Amen. You Amen. And as a church, we have also learned the importance of language. Language is not just spoken. We have our our challenged uh, members of our church, and that's why we, we have uh, our sign language interpreters who help us interpret in a language that they can understand. But the point is, let the word be in you, be sensitive to the needs of those around you, and then the Lord will give you the power to speak and to express to them that which Jesus needs them to know about him. Sire, let me come to you. Because we see a Jesus who had been with, the, with, with, his, with his disciples for a while, and, and at one point, you almost see disappointment in him when he's telling them. Uh, and this is, we are looking at Mark chapter 8 from verse 13, uh, from verse 11 to 13. And we are seeing at a point at which um, he's, he's disappointed at the fact that the Pharisees actually come to him and ask for a sign. Just the audacity of them asking for a physical sign. And Jesus I think looks at them and just says, this is the second time he sighs in Mark. When he looks at them and he says, why does this generation seek a sign? Really, because assuredly I say unto you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Why would Jesus have a problem with giving, number one, the Pharisees this sign? What was that? But also he then comes to his own disciples. And you can also see the disappointment in, in, in him when he actually tells them to beware of the living bread of the Pharisees. As in he, he actually tells them, beware of what your, this other, your leaders are, are suffering from because you're about to get it if you're not careful. What is that thing? Yeah, thanks, Marcy. Um, just removing something from my mind, like uh, his elders' conversation about the kiss with the <laughs> five-year-old. And just my mind is thinking, like, hmm, how did that conversation start? <laughs> well, it's a funny one, though. Okay. Um, when you read the whole of Scripture, you at times even want to rewrite the name of Pharisees to mm. Pharisees, you know, like, um, <laughs> because every... Every interaction with them, you, you, you almost left feel like, ah, sigh, you know, mm -hmm. every, every time. Let me use a, um, let me try use two examples. One is medical. In, in, in medicine, um, when somebody is in some conditions, people are in pain and you cannot, um, you keep giving them pain medication, you know, and keep increasing the dosage and then, with time, you even change the medication to even become stronger. And then it reaches a certain point where you've reached mm -hmm. the strongest medication and the most legal, uh, most safest dosage of that medication, and they are not responding. Injecting that patient with even more medication does mm -hmm. not serve any further purpose. In fact, it's injurious. It's, in a certain sense, what's happening in... Mark 8, um, 11 through 13, because A, this is not the first interaction the Pharisees have had with Jesus. They've seen him teaching. They've seen him um, performing all manner of miracles. And so when they're coming to him and asking for a son, it's akin to that patient who's been having um, pain and the doctor has given every other thing and just pumping more medicine in there will not be able to do any more good. The second thing is a concept called programmed non-responsiveness. This is where if you keep 
if you keep teaching people and not demanding or requiring them to take action, it soon reaches a point where the information gotten does not lead to any further response. And so that's what Jesus is saying against at this point. He, he does not respond to that. He does not give them a miracle. He does not give them any sign because to just keep flooding them with more and more and more evidence, yet they have not appropriated or responded or um, looked into or thought of through the abundant previous examples. If Jesus keeps us flooding them with more signs or honoring this particular ill faith request, what he'd be doing is you'd be teaching their hearts to become non-responsive to the truth and the light already received. The individual application for that is, to every individual is, what we times need is not more light, it's not more truth, mm -hmm. it is responding to what we have now. Yeah. The way truth and light works is like feeding a child. Every time you scoop food and you present to the child, as long as the child opens a mouth and you put the food and they chew and swallow, that process will continue. But if you reach the point where every time you're presenting more food and the child is standing away their head, you have to retreat the food. And it's not because you're being malicious or there's no, you don't have the ability to feed them. It is more to do with how the child is responding to the food. So we need to ask ourselves, at what stage are we in with God? Are we busy asking for more light, for more truth? And I know I've belabored this point, but what, let me just put it more point, po 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 poignantly. I don't know how to say that word nicely. Is one of the best places to hide against away from God is within spiritual things. Mm. When God has revealed his clear will, more prayer is not necessary. Yeah. In, when Joshua, um, after the debacle with the children of Israel going against Ai and being beaten, and yet the problem was some guy had stolen stuff from Jericho, and that is what the problem was. Joshua spent a whole day fasting and praying, and God's response was, why are you sitting here? They mm. sin within the camp. You need to go deal um, with that. So at times you find, um, you know, mercy is um, dating somebody who, it's very clear it's not God's will for her. And when you ask Marcy, hey, Marcy, why are you doing this? She's saying, hey, guys, I'm praying about it. <laughs> no, you're hiding behind prayer. You're not very different from the Pharisees who are asking for a sign mm -hmm. when they have chosen at to this point not to respond That's to true. what they have. And in a certain degree, that same spirit, a different, different flavor of it, is present with the disciples mm -hmm. when in Mark 8, 14 to 21, they had forgotten to carry bread um, with them. And so when Jesus, uh, when, um, when Jesus talks to them about leaven, they're already thinking about their guilt. They're coming already with a pre-guilt, but it's, they are, what, what they're doing is they're projecting their insecurity, they're mm -hmm. projecting their failures on Jesus' teaching, and it's making them miss Jesus' point mm -hmm. at that individual time. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus is talking about leaven is in, in, when you speak, when you see it in Matthew 16, 12, and um, when he speaks about certain parables is the impact of teaching or of doctrine or of ideas mm -hmm. in influencing behavior and character. That's what Christ is talking to them about. And in this particular regard, it is that leaven, that attitude of rejecting mm -hmm. or resisting the light and still asking for more light. Christ is opposed to that. That's what he's saying, like, hey, be careful about the leaven of the Pharisees. Mm. But the disciples, their predisposition to this is one of self-preservation. And that is why they're thinking more about, hey, maybe he's leading us this way because we forgot bread. Mm. And we need to safeguard against that because many times we arrive to the truth and rather than taking it and allowing it to light our path and show us what God would like to see and show us, we are projecting on the word our own fears, our own insecurities, our own preconceived notions. And by so doing, we prevent ourselves from um, receiving it well. Christ responds to this by telling them, hey, this is not about bread. Mm. Um, I'm able to multiply bread. I did it with the 4,000. I did it with the 5,000. So this is not about you not being able to have physical bread. I have mm. showed you I'm able to multiply and provide that. This has everything to do with taking the wrong influence of the Pharisees 
and same spirit and bringing it into your lives. And so similarly, we need to allow God to light within our lives. Oh, thank you, Sire. And the truth is, in spite of all the evidence that God has given us about his love for us, it is still possible to find ourselves dwelling in doubt. Uh, and yet the Lord is telling us, you have seen me do all this among you. Even for us in our day-to-day lives, we have seen God's evidence in everything that we have done. May we not doubt him. As we come to the end this morning, uh, the fr- uh, we, we have a quote from the book Desire of Ages, which is a powerful book that talks about the works and works of Jesus Christ. And there's a quote that says that among the followers of our Lord today, as of the old, how widespread is the subtle deceptive sin? How often our services to Christ, our communion with one another is marred by the secret desire to exalt self. How ready the thought of self gratulation and the longing of human approval. It is the love of self, the desire for an easier way than God's appointed that leads to the substitution of human theories and the traditions, for, uh, uh, human theories and traditions for the dis- divine precepts. To his own disciples, the warning words of Jesus are spoken. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. This morning, dear uh, dear beloved, the Lord is saying that sometimes it's very possible that very subtly that we find ourselves getting deceived into a desire that in our service and communion for one another, we desire to exalt self. You desire for people to give you approval, whether it is in service of the Lord, in your preaching and in our service, even as we do this study. Are we desiring human approval? Is, it, is God looking at us and seeing in us a desire to see what other people think about us and our service? The Lord is saying that the religion, the religion of Christ is sincerity itself. Zeal for glo- God's glory is the motive implanted by the Holy Spirit. And the only effectual working of the Spirit can implant this motive. What is your motive this morning? Why do you do what you do? Why do you serve the Lord in the ministry that you're serving the Lord? Is there in you, in the slightest, a motive for self-exaltation? Have we kept and only kept the desire to glorify God as first and foremost in our, in our lives? I don't know what your inside looks like, my dear brother and sister. But may the Lord work on the inside, and when he works on the inside, the outside will show. I pray that the Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless your families and give you a blessed week, even as we come to the end of our week of our Sabbath school study this morning. Next week, we look at the teaching disciples and and how Jesus went about now. He moves from miracles and and demonstrating his his power through other things, and now he goes directly to one-on-one teaching his disciples because he's slowly going towards his end ministry, which was his death on the cross. We'll see you next week. May the Lord bless you, even as we pray to close the lesson for this morning. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, this morning we want to thank you for the lesson that you've reminded us, that the inside matters. And we pray that you would change us from the inside, and our outside will show. Bless us today, our Father. Remember the bereaved this day, and remember our brothers and sisters far and wide, wherever they are this day, that, Lord, we will grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. We thank you and we honor you this Sabbath day. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.